name is Andre Roux and today's We Read For You session presented by University of Stellenbosch Business School, I, I will review a book written by Sambiter Blanche called Lost in Transformation. In a nutshell, Sambiter Blanche bemoans the fact that our political economic transformation since 1994 has been unsuccessful and in many ways he argues dysfunctional. He does so by reflecting upon the unfortunate impact of American or the Americanization of society and indeed of South Africa. He bemoans the fact that labor laws have become too stringent and he argues that failure to address ideologies and failure to adopt the right ideology could actually perpetuate poverty, unemployment and income inequality in South Africa. I'm going to start off by looking at what his fundamental conclusion is and then take it from there. Uh, as I'll be trying to explain as we go along, he argues, as we all know, that in the first half of the 1990s, both the political and the economic sides of our dual political economic system were radically changed. That we all know. But his main argument is these changes were the wrong ones. And uh, for various reasons we'll look at, as a result of making the wrong changes, the new system is operating dysfunctionally. He suggests that 1986 was a really important year in the country's history, at least in terms of the transformation. Four events occurred in that year. One of them was Chernobyl, that, that terrible nuclear disaster in Russia. And he reckons that this sort of confirmed or reminded Russia that they'd lost a great deal of their nuclear te technological expertise, and in fact, their overall technological expertise. As some of us might recall, June 1986, a comprehensive state of emergency was declared in this country. And finally, in 1986, the first of a few summit meetings between Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan. In 1986, pressure came from Moscow on the ANC to seek a negotiated settlement. As Russia said, we can't afford to finance you anymore. And at the same time, there was pressure from Washington on our then white government to do the same. So we were forced, or the various parties were forced by events and circumstances to meaningfully seek some kind of compromise leading ultimately to transformation. In the early 70s, Richard Nixon abandoned the gold standard and that created the opportunity for America to create huge amounts of money, copious amounts of money in the 1970s. They printed money, they created money and this found its way all over the world. And this huge and easy availability of finance facilitated, very importantly, the relocation of industrial production from the West to the rest, or from the West to the South. The South here is a metaphor for the developing world. And this revolution was good for those countries in the South that were on the right track in terms of industrializing. They became even further industrialized with Western support. So we find within the Southern countries a bifurcation between the industrializing developing countries and the non-industrializing developing countries. This neoliberal empire was legitimized. It looked very good on paper, sounded very conventional, very orthodox, because it was backed by market fundamentalism and this neoliberal uh, globalism. But, says Terra Blanche, one of the major problems was and still is that this rise of global capitalism was not accompanied by an equally rapid rise in global democracy. Why is this important for South Africa? Because he reckons that these newish ideologies were sold triumphantly to South Africa in the early 1990s. In the days of negotiation and seeking compromise, the Americanization of our system uh, was firmly established. He makes the point far more powerfully, as you can see. The Americanization of our system during the transformation was based on the wrong ideological premises, on the wrong power structures, and put this country on the wrong development path. From 1652 to the early 90s, we could perhaps identify four fundamental political economic systems in South Africa. The first one, from the 1650s to the late 1700s, the period of the Dutch East Indian Company. Then we had British colonialism in the 19th century. In the first half of the 20th century, the mineral energy complex, along with various governments. And then from around right about 1948 to 1994, the mineral energy complex, 
and the National Party government. The capitalist corporate side was far more powerful than the political side or the state, if you like. Uh, this is economic growth going back to 1946. Uh, in the 1960s, round about 5.6%, but then as you can see, the gradual stagnation in economic growth. And this argues some people are blanched together with all, all the other pressures we mentioned a bit earlier from America, from Russia, resulted in our transformation. But, he argues, this transformation was orchestrated by big business in general, the mineral energy complex in particular. They were faced with five difficult impediments. Namely, first of all, how to convince the ANC, then in exile, to abandon its socialist orientation. How to prevent the ANC from becoming simply a populist government inclined towards significant redistribution. How to ensure that capitalist corporations would remain in a dominant position vis-a-vis -vis the new political authority. How to convince the National Party, then in power, about the inevitability of a political settlement. And finally, how to interact with black and seemingly militant trade union, the then militant trade union movement, reminding you Kusato was established in 1985. Between 1990 and 1996, the ANC's views underwent a almost revolutionary transformation from initially being explicitly socialist and redistributive, and then five, six years later, embracing this idea of neoliberal globalism. He says that this system, this new neoliberal system, was institutionalized to serve the narrow interests of two kinds of elites, the old white elite and the emerging black elite. In the mid-1990s, our manufacturing sector accounted for around about 22% of the total economy. That is now down to barely 15%. Ends of this chapter by identifying eight weaknesses of our system of democracy, and or weaknesses uh, within government. <coughs> this is a fact. The population remains divided ethnically and racially. Government is too powerless to address the very unequal distribution of income. Large parts of the population are unable to make a contemplative choice between different parties during general elections. He has a problem with our system of proportional representation. There aren't enough watchdog organizations to enforce accountability. And then again, that elite compromise has ended up establishing a very cozy relationship between the government and the corporate sector. The ANC's sovereignty is constrained by what he calls a triple attack, a triple whammy, each one of which has a capitalist flavor. So we're confronted by the, the mineral energy complex capitalist formation, the BEE capitalist formation, and global capitalism. Affirmative action is a, is a chapter title, and the rapid Africanization of the bureaucracy. And he starts off by, by using a, coin, a, a phrase, not coined by him, but he uses it very usefully, that of unfree black labor. And he says, at least since the 1650s, that has been part and parcel of the country's history, a history of unfree black labor, ranging from, at times, slavery, indentureship, various master and servants acts, the migrant labor system, sorry, should be a comma there, influx control, the old Dompa system, labor discrimination, and then more recently, another form of unfree black labor is growing unemployment. And again, we know that story. And he says that back in 1994, the ANC was faced with two serious problems. One at the top of what he calls the black labor pyramid and one at the bottom. At the top, the problem was a very small representation of black people in senior and executive positions. At the bottom, large and growing levels of unemployment. And then, another contentious statement. In his opinion, the ANC's attitude towards the poor has changed over the past 20 years. 20 years ago, reference to the deserving poor, and they the first priority. Now, there seems to be a shift towards referring to the undeserving poor. Inequality is about the undeserved poverty of the poor vis-a-vis -vis the undeserved wealth of the rich. In post-94 South Africa, he says, this elite compromise um, has been a major contributor towards this inequality. 
So we confronted with a serious poverty problem as well, and here's another interesting and perhaps contentious statement, we also have a serious opulence problem. Uh, it's not just about too many poor people, but too many opulent people. The fairy tale optimism of the National Development Plan versus the likelihood that poverty, unemployment, income, uh, income distribution will be perpetuated. This is too much trust is being placed in what the NDP calls a new story of a virtuous cycle of expanding opportunities. He also says that the NDP, naturally, understandably, refers to righting the wrongs of the past. But, says something to Blanche, government is part of the problem and cannot, therefore, be part of the solution. He says, again scathingly, the government is too weak, too myopic, too short-sighted, too corrupt to take the initiative. It lacks the capacity to call the capitalist corporate sector to account. The problem of poverty, unemployment, income inequality could be even more severe in 2030 than today. What then, in his opinion, are the real stumbling blocks en route to so solving the, the poverty problem? One stumbling block is the Americanization of the economy. A second one is the elite compromise. In fact, these are actually the two that he highlights. These two will institutionally block or impede achieving a, a, a true solution. So he asks a number of questions. Will government, is government, can government de-Americanize our economy? Can we move away from the, from the ideology of neoliberalism? Will government hold all those corporations that enrich themselves during the apartheid years accountable for the exploitation of unfree black labor? This final chapter is actually a summary. What went wrong? Let's summarize everything. What went wrong? What is going wrong? The post-apartheid period is in many ways as immoral and as inhumane as, as the previous period. There's an adoption of an extravagant, get-rich-quick mentality, consumerism, and maybe, if I may be so bold, everyone's using the same word, there's, there's the sense of, of, of entitlement seems to be encroaching upon many of us. Only a small minority of the black population has benefited from BEE. President Mandela spoke wonderfully about the need to create a people-centered society, goodwill, tolerance, willingness to act in harmony. And perhaps his most damning sentence of them all towards the end. The more recalcitrant and the more myopic the small enriched elite with huge vested interest in the present dispensation becomes, the greater the danger that the next systemic crisis will turn out to be a massive derailment of the system rather than an opportunity to improve that system. There's growing resentment that 99% of the population is being held hostage by 1%, the rich fat cats, more specifically Wall Street. The main vice of capitalism is the uneven distribution of prosperity. The main vice of socialism is the even distribution of misery. <laughs> Clearly, Sambita de Blanche well, he's not a big fan of American-style capitalism, and he believes that somehow we were duped into accepting this American-style capitalism, and along with the, the lobbying by the so-called elites, the old and the new elite, that has created a system, an institutional system in South Africa, which is not beneficial for achieving the really important things, namely alleviating poverty, reducing unemployment, and narrowing that income gap. Some of you might have, a year or so ago, attended a similar session where I was fortunate to cover another book by Darby Ruet. There the, there the whole story was totally different. He is an unashamed capitalist, an unbridled capitalist. And he, he obviously, you can imagine, in his book, he criticizes uh, government, any government, for whatever reason. And he, and he, and he promotes and he pushes for Capitalism, in its very real sense of the word. But interestingly, although they're coming from two totally different parts, two, 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 two totally different angles, they are both in agreement about the concerns today about government inefficiency. Not necessarily an agreement about government policies, but an agreement about government inefficiency.